the Virginia Horse Industry Board, Southwest Virginia Agricultural Association, and the Virginia Christmas Tree Growers Association are proud sponsors of Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Large or small, Virginia farmers work year-round to help put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, offering its hardest working, smoothest riding, full size workhorses, including the all new 60 horse Power Ranger XP900. Hunt, farm, or trail. Polaris has the full size Ranger you want at Polaris.com. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Steve Morse, fruit grower, distiller, entrepreneur. Another personal story on FarmFamilyPeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. Hi everybody, welcome to Virginia Farming. I'm Amy Rocher. An amendment to the Right to Farm Act, House Bill 1430, was basically substituted with another bill by the General Assembly earlier this week. Now much of the language that protected small farmers was removed. Trey Davis with Virginia Farm Bureau joins us on Ag Insights to share why Farm Bureau opposes the bill in its original form. Then we'll find out how to start seedlings when we join Mark Viette in the garden. Plus we'll have the Ag Calendar and a Minute in the Field video. All this plus the Ag News of the Week on this edition of Virginia Farming. Dana Allen Fisher of Shenandoah County was named the winner of this year's American Farm Bureau Federation Young Farmers and Ranchers Excellence in Agriculture Award. He was recognized at the annual convention in Nashville, Tennessee. Fisher is an agriculture instructor who teaches classes in leadership, horticulture, and natural resources. He's also an FFA advisor and has served on the FFA Foundation Board in several roles. He chairs his County Farm Bureau's Young Farmers Committee and has served on the VFBF Young Farmers Committee for the past three years. Congratulations, Dana. Well, our good news continues, at least in the dairy industry. Purdue Extension Dairy Specialist Mike Schutz says the turbulence that has shaken the dairy industry the past few years could subside in the second half of this year if feed prices fall or at least stabilize. Although the first part of 2013 will likely be stressful for producers, Schutz says those who hold on should benefit from a relatively neutral economic outlook for the remainder of the year. Some producers may still be short on forage supplies, so Schutz recommends that they keep a close eye on feed prices and check their inventories frequently. Farmers with low inventories can consider planting an early spring forage crop, giving those farmers the opportunity to double crop and produce more forage before next winter. Disposition and animal handling can impact a cow herd. Whether in the pasture or in the feedlot, it pays to keep cattle calm and comfortable. Cindy Campbell reports. Do everything you can to create calm cattle. That message from animal scientist Rinaldo Cook, who says disposition affects everything from a calf's carcass quality to a cow's reproduction. Bottom line is every time you have a really aggressive cow, that becomes a stress because of human handling, the chance of that cow to become pregnant goes down significantly. The same thing with heifers, replacement heifers. If you have aggressive heifers and you don't handle them properly, the chance of that heifer to become pubertal by 12 months of age or pregnant by 15 months of age goes down significantly. In the feedlot, Iowa research shows that aggressive cattle earn $57 less on a grid than their docile counterparts. They also have a higher death loss. So what's a producer to do? The first thing that I would like to do, that I like to do with the replacement heifers that we have at the research station is to get them used to humans as much as possible. So after weaning, you know, when we select our replacement heifers, make sure that when you go feed those heifers, you get out of the truck, get out of the tractor or the horse, whatever. Just walk among them for like five minutes, get them used to you. So next time you bring them to the cow pens, they won't be too excited about the whole situation because they've seen you before. Cook also suggests limiting the use of dogs and hot shots. He notes adopting low stress handling is not just about economics either. You know, selecting animals for temperament, uh, it's not only 
important to optimize production efficiency in, in CalCAF operations, but also you know create a safer environment you know to work. And uh, but only selecting for temperament, it's it's just not enough. You have to be able to handle those animals properly, because if you have an animal that's naturally calm, and you don't handle them properly, and what I what I mean properly properly is on a, a low stress um, uh, scenario. So by doing that, the producer is not only gaining on the production side, on the reproduction side, but also maintaining safety on, the, on those uh, working conditions. Cook says increased pregnancy rates, better calves, and fewer work-related injuries should be enough reasons to take a look at your animal handling. I'm Cindy Campbell. Thank you, Cindy. House Bill 1430 is an amendment to the Right to Farm Act. Today, we'll present the opposing side of the bill when Virginia Farm Bureau's Trey Davis joins us on Ag Insights. House Bill 1430, an amendment to Virginia's Right to Farm Act, was passed by Virginia's House earlier this week and it has now moved to the Senate. The bill has been reworked and much of the language has changed. Joining us today with the opposing viewpoint of the original bill is Trey Davis, Assistant Director of Governmental Relations for the Virginia Farm Bureau. Trey, welcome to Virginia Farming. Thank you for having me, Amy. Um, my first question is, why was Virginia Farm Bureau opposed to the original bill? Sure, and I'll give you a little little bit of background on the Right to Farm Act as well as our okay. uh, process for creating policy and the policy that I represent. But the Right to Farm Act, uh, before this bill went into effect with the language that you had in there, uh, was part of a, a lot of uh, work in the 1994 General Assembly session. And the language that you had in there was an agreement between the agricultural community, farmers of all sizes, and local government to put in language that would protect traditional agricultural production with also, by also giving localities a reasonable amount of say-so in, in what those uh, operations could look like. But sure. it was really meant to protect farmers from somebody moving into the Shenandoah Valley, for example, and saying, I don't like the, the smell of poultry manure next door. Uh, our membership uh, this past December, and this is from farmers all over the state, uh, folks on five acres, folks on 5,000 acres, a policy they adopted after hearing about some of the things that had gone on, particularly in 2012 in Virginia, uh, and what some folks perceive as a violation of the right to farm. They came to us and they voted by majority that we think the current Right to Farm Act adequately protects farmers here in Virginia. And so they were to oppose any changes that could be brought forth in the 2013 session. Uh, with that being said, with House Bill 1430 sponsored by Delegate Lingenfelter, uh, when it dropped on legislative services and we started to delve through uh, what it did, in a lot of ways it has the potential to get rid of many of the protections, protections that farmers already have. And what I mean by that is part of the, the good uh, part of the right to farm is that it allows localities to strengthen their own ordinances in regards to value added or agritourism or byproducts of agriculture. And a good example of that is, is right here in Rockingham County. Rockingham had a situation there where they saw folks wanting to sell products off their farm. Uh, it wasn't violation of the right to farm. They wanted to do things to encourage those folks by creating ordinances. So they sat down with the Board of Supervisors, with the Planning Commission, with farmers in the area, and they created their own ordinances that were specific here in Rockingham County. Mm -hmm. Because agritourism in, in Lee County is going to be very different than what you have on the Eastern Shore. And something that our members have said to us is, we want these kind of decisions kept at the local level rather than be manda mandated by the state. Absolutely, and I think that's important because of what you say, every region is different, and I think you have to apply uh, different rules to different regions for their specific causes. Exactly. Okay, so this bill has been reworked, re rewritten, if you will. Who rewrote it, and how does that happen? The process this bill went through, and. Uh, myself and some other representatives of the agricultural community, we met with Delegate Liam Felter, I met with Ms. Bonetta and some of the other supporters of the bill, and we weren't really able to find any uh, compromise language, I think really some because of some of the fundamental disagreements of what should be in this code section. Uh, the bill uh, that you have right now, the substitute for House Bill 1430, which is available uh, for everyone to read on the General Assembly website, uh, that was really amended in the subcommittee and then further amended in the full House Agriculture Committee two days later. Uh, and you're talking about last Wednesday. 
and the language that is going to the Senate and will be heard in the Senate Agriculture Committee. Uh, the words that you put in there were approved by the subcommittee and further approved by the committee. So in terms of who actually amended it, it was the delegates that serve on those committees. Okay, so Virginia Farm Bureau does support this reworked amendment, is that correct? We do not support the substitute that you have, that you have in there now. And okay. while I do think the language is better, uh, it, gets, it gets rid of a lot of language that local governments had a problem with, but it's still extremely broad. And in the substitute right now, the way the bill is written, it has a lot of terms in there that I'm not sure anybody has really had time to, to weigh what they actually mean. And it talks about specifically farm to business and farm to consumer sales. Uh, my, my hesitance with saying that that is, is very good is I'm not exactly sure what those terms mean because they haven't been approved in the code. So let's say we had a producer that wanted to sell farm to farm. Because that's not spelled out specifically, uh, would that, you know, would that, uh, would the new language that you have in the substitute prevent you from, from doing that? And nobody has the answer. It also had language in there. It talks about food and beverage and furniture, things that, uh, for the large part, you can still do in Virginia right now under the current right to farm. But it adds mm -hmm. some language in there that you can sell anything on agricultural land that is related to an agricultural operation. It doesn't have to be grown on your farm. doesn't have to be grown on your neighbor's farm. It doesn't have to be grown anywhere in America. Okay. And a term as broad as it can be related to your agricultural operation, if it were to pass as is, I think you would have somebody that wanted to bring in uh, canned tomato sauce from Japan and sell it on agricultural land. And as the bill is now, you'd be able to do that. And I think part of the issue uh, with that is you're going to have local governments trying to uh, get rid of land zone agricultural, and, that, and that's a very large concern of ours. Right, and, and it's that, it's the zoning commission, and going back to Martha Bonetta's instance, it's the zoning commission that I that I personally feel was really out of place, um, but don't you feel that that some of these smaller farmers or the farmers in general need some type of a protection from these uh, county overlords who see themselves as complete and utter lawmakers laying it down, but they're not abiding by the Constitution. They're not. They're going out on hearsay and uh, uh, um, putting fines on farms, closing farms down when they haven't even been out, in Martha's case, to even inspect and, and visit the farm before they do that. So here she is, her farm's closed, she has all these fines weighing on her, and now she has a lot of litigation fines because she's trying to fight it because she's a small farmer trying to make ends meet. Do you, do you not think that some type of language can be worked into that bill to hold um, zoning zoning ordinances and and county governments somewhat culpable for for making these decisions. And I, I'll I'm gonna try to answer that in, in two parts, Amy. And specifically with with Miss Bonetta's case, um, there's always going to be con conflicting reports on uh, what actually happened. And, and so from from my end, in, in representing an organization that represents farmers from all over. I can't weigh in on the specifics of it rather than look at, look at what the bill would do. Uh, what I can share is that Falkier County Farm Bureau and the other county farm bureaus, and there's 88 of them in Virginia, when they looked at that specific example, they did not think it was a violation of the Right to Farm Act. And in terms of any ordinance that you have at the local level, you know, at, at no point can it violate Virginia Constitution or the United States Constitution because at, at that point you have a legal remedy, you know, in that it is unconstitutional. This last part of your question, do I think language could be worked out uh, to make the Right to Farm Act code section stronger? I, I think, I, I'm not sure there's anybody in Virginia that could tell you there probably aren't a few changes that could be made. Um, my hesitance to, to do it is because I haven't talked to the, the folks in the example I used earlier, I haven't asked Lee County what would they need in this code section. I haven't asked my members in ACOMAC what would they need in this code section. So could it be right. stronger? Yes. Um, does it need a lot more work and time for everyone to sit down as stakeholders? I think definitely. But I think uh, even just a broad general language letting the counties know that you know, you have to go in and look. You have to have some type of written documentation that there's something wrong. You can't go in on hearsay. I mean, that to me would go a long way 
you know, in protecting some of these small farmers who have been inundated with the come here from the large cities that think that everything, you know, has to be a certain way and they're not very educated on agriculture and agricultural practices. I just really think that some type of language would, would help protect them a little more from their county governments, you know. And it also goes into the fact that these small farmers are having to pay for all this litigation out of their pocket where the counties and the zoning committees and whoever else is enforcing these, they don't, they don't have that expense. And I, I think, I, I agree with what you were saying in terms of uh, farmers be needed to that protection, uh, not just in, in terms of their neighbors, but in the community as a whole. And, and that's, you're exactly right, that is the intent of the Right to Farm Act. Unfortunately, this part, uh, to this point between uh, our membership's view and the supporters of this legislation uh, in the patron's office, we have not been able, uh, <coughs> excuse me, to, to find that compromise. Okay. Uh, do I hope we can do it in the future? Uh, absolutely. And I know, uh, I hope that as we move forward that Farm Bureau will have a seat at the table to uh, make the Right to Farm Act stronger. I do too. I'm, I'm, I think we need to work on a little bit. Um, but my, my last question is that there's a reenactment provision sure. in the bill now, which basically means that um, if it goes through Senate, if it passes through the Senate, it will not be enacted until 2014, where again, it needs to go through both House and Senate committees Correct. again. What's the purpose of that? The purpose of, of that reenactment clause, and that was a reenactment clause put, in, put on by the full House Agriculture Committee, is sort of uh, what I was talking about earlier in that everybody wants to make sure you don't pass something that when it goes into effect July 1st you have unintended consequences. And so I think the, not to speak on, on behalf of, of the delegates, but I think they put it on there to make sure that we didn't pass something that we weren't sure what it meant and that when August, September, October started rolling around, you had folks looking at this as a way to get around zone nuances and create right. a situation where small farmers were sort of pushed out the door because of what others were doing on agricultural land. So it was put on there, I think, to make sure that if, if we can meet uh, between, between now and the 2014 session, that if, that's the, if this language that we have in front of us is the right way to go, then we know it for sure and the next General Assembly will be able to move on. So is that something you're looking to do? You're going to meet between now and then, hopefully with um, Lingham Felter and, and some of the other folks involved and try to maybe rework this so it really does cover sure. everybody? And that's something in, in meeting with, with Ms. Bonetta and some of the supporters and, and certainly de Delegate Lingham Felter that we have said uh, since the get-go that if you want to move forward with this, uh, we'll be the, the first person to stand beside you and, and move forward and come up with the best possible language. I think there's some commitment from uh, those in the Department of Agriculture that are ready and willing to sit down in the off season, if you will, and really look at what needs to be out there. So yes, we're, uh, we're definitely ready to do that. Well, that's good news because I think that's going to benefit everybody and hopefully we'll get this moving in the right direction and make everybody happy. I think that's... It's uh, hard to do this day and age, it isn't is, it? It is, <laughs> but uh, that's, what, that's what good policy, particularly good uh, farm policy in Virginia is all about. Absolutely. Trey, thank you so much for being with us today. I really do appreciate it. Sure. Thank you, Amy. We'll be right back. Starting your own seedlings is a great way to add some variety to your garden. Let's join Mark Viette in the garden. One of the key factors in starting your own seed is cleanliness. That means your whole work area needs to be real clean. In addition to that, you need to be sure, uh, I personally recommend using brand new trays which have never been used before. And so that you really don't have the problems with disease organisms. I also recommend a soilless mix. And right here I have two different types. I have a coarse mix and then I have a very fine mix. I really prefer the fine mix when you're seeding your own seed. Up to help clean your area, of course, you need to make sure that it's brushed off. Then I also recommend a Clorox type solution just to help kill anything on the surface that you're dealing with. If you really take these steps and use new pots like peat pots or brand new clay pots, you will find that your success will be great with starting your own seed. My favorite type of container to use would be plastic. It's really easy to use and they're disposable. 
And these are great because you can get different types of trays and different numbers of compartments, anywhere from maybe 500 little containers to a tray this big to maybe 12 or 18. And I really like this one. This one has about 36 compartments. It's great to seed your own vegetables. One of the key factors in seeding your own is don't do too many of each. You really want to be able to have a lot of variety. It's going to give you a much better vegetable garden. And really what you need to do is just come in here and get some of the soilless mix and partially fill each of the containers. So there's a little space left for seed. And then keep in mind some seed gets covered and some seed does not get covered. And right here we'll seed some flowering sunflowers. And you know, you can just take them and put one to two seeds per container. And when it comes to buying seed, I like to get seed packets that have real clear and concise growing instructions. And once you're done, you then can come in with a material that is called milled sphagnum. It's what makes up peat moss in many cases. It's a very fine material. And usually you cover the seed with about two times its depth. And so you can just carefully sift some of this material. This is great because it has some antibiotic and antifungal qualities. So it helps prevent your seed from damping off or dying uh, when it first germinates. Then the other thing that's critical is to well label your seed. And I really find that pencils work the best. So you write the name and a variety. Put that in your container. Then you're just about all set once that's done. You then need to irrigate this, and you need to use a, a watering can with a very fine mist. And just a couple times, you would just go through, and as it soaks through, you would do it again. And once you're done, that's it. Then you need to either put this in your own greenhouse or your own little uh, humidity tent. Sometimes you can purchase these trays with plastic coverings and you're set to go. And you usually want to do this anywhere from one to three months prior to when you're going to plant these young plants in the garden. If you don't have your own greenhouse or if you don't have enough light, you can add light by getting an inexpensive fluorescent light fixture. All you need to do is suspend it above your seedlings at about 12 inches in height. Growing your own seed is fun, it's easy, and you can also grow things that you can't normally buy in your own stores. Good luck with growing your own seed. I'm Mark Viet. Join me next time in the garden. Taking a brief look at our ag calendar, the Virginia No-Tillage Alliance Winter Conferences are happening February 12th through the 15th. Farmers interested in getting into no-till crop production or expanding their knowledge of no-till will be interested in this year's lineup of speakers from all over the United States. For more information or to register, visit virginianotill.com. This year's Local Food Networks Conference will be held February 26 at the Virginia Farm Bureau Office in Richmond. The conference will feature information and resources for direct marketing of agriculture with a focus on dairy, poultry, eggs, produce, and value-added foods. Networking opportunity for buyers and sellers will take place in the afternoon, and registration is required. More information can be found at vafarmbureau.org. Well, that does it for our show this week. Have a great week, everyone. I'm Amy Rocher for Virginia Farming. This program is brought to you by the Virginia Farm Bureau. From apples to zucchini, Virginia farmers work hard to put food on your table. And Farm Bureau works year-round to help farmers and all Virginians. Farming, it's all good. 
To learn more, go to vafarmbureau.org. Polaris, offering its hardest working, smoothest riding off-road ATVs, led by the rugged, more powerful Sportsman 850HO. Hunt far more trail. Polaris has the Sportsman ATV you want at Polaris.com. Brought to you by Farm Family. Life, auto, business, farm. Jim Gray, farmer's son, agribusiness owner, insurance agent. Another personal story on farmfamilypeople.com. Farm Family, the people you know. Join Virginia Farming on Facebook. Get updates throughout the week on topics that matter to Virginia farmers and consumers. Share your thoughts and ideas with us and stay connected with agriculture in the Commonwealth. Find us and like us. Virginia Farming on Facebook. We'll see you there.